So I tend to think in terms of cool and warm colours. So this is, I haven't quite finished here yet, but I've got white roughly in the middle. And then the reds and earthy browns are on this side, leading down to black. And then the cool colours, although yellow is not really cool, is it? But forgetting about that, the cooler colours are down here. But here's alizarin, alizarin crimson, which is this kind of blue red, a very cool red, compared with uh, cadmium red light, which is a very orangey, very warm red. And so if we use something like that, and then something like yellow ochre. The good thing about yellow ochre is it, it's quite cool. And so it tends to offset the warmth of that alizarin. Yeah. So you can see how bright that colour is. You can see it's it's like very burnt, like a lobster colour. Mm. So if you mix a neutraliser, which could in this case, well, in this case, it would be black. It could be a number of other colours. It could be blue or green. But if we mix black with that, Firstly, it's darkening, and that's not really what I'm looking to do. So if I mix a bit of, this is just titanium white, with that black, then tonally it's kind of bringing it back to where it was, this original colour, mm. or close to it. But you can see how it's a very grey version of that. Yeah. But if you look at it in isolation, it's actually a warm, it's actually a, a colour that you might use in, in fact, I've, I've used even a cooler colour in Maggie's face here. But say a colour like that might yeah. well be, you know, that combination. Yes. But when you see it like that on the against the white, it just, it looks so dark. No, that's right. So if I'm working on a white canvas and it's, it's just a, a large white area and I've got a white palette to work on, I'm comparing apples with apples. So if, if you're working on, a say, a, a timber palette or a darker coloured palette of some description, either glass, a glass sheet over some coloured paper or something of that sort, um, it, it's helpful to have the canvas the same colour. So again, you're comparing like with like. This is that Venetian red, the one that we looked at down here. Yep. And this is such a lovely colour for flesh tones. You get that beautiful earthy pink, but it's not too kind of lolly-ish it's it's still earthy mm. but it's so pink and then if you mix a bit of yellow ochre just to to, to kind of bring it down a, a peg or so and it's still a bit bright so again that mixture of white and black just helps to neutralize it a little bit and you can almost imagine that sort of color maybe that's probably still a bit too raw, but you can imagine that transition from warm to a slightly cooler version of the same colour appearing in a, you know, a flesh tone, say, where the, the hand is receding back around the form or something of that sort. Yeah, yeah. Another really useful colour here is Naples Yellow. Yep. This very kind of citrusy Naples Yellow. And that, mixed with alizarin, produces such a lovely... Flesh to, like a very olivey flesh tone. When I say olivey, flesh tone that kind of resembles the, the yellow in, in flesh. You probably still need to mix a little bit of a, a neutraliser still because it, otherwise it's a bit raw. In a, in a sense, it's easier to start with the colour looking a bit brighter and then knocking it back. Essentially the dark part of flesh tones, the shadows, are really just brown. But you don't want to paint them brown because it looks dead and drab. But if you think about what makes up brown, it's red and green. If you put them together, you get brown. So what I tend to do, if I want to get a very dark, like the darkest dark flesh tone, I'll use alizarin, which is very dark, and then something like this green, which just really is the opposite, obviously, to red. But the combination of the two produce a dark but not dead mm. colour. And then usually with a little bit of maybe just spicing it up a little bit with those other those colours there. You can see how that might be. That's probably a bit too red for so most rather, uses. Yeah. But you can see how that might be useful, say, you know, in these shadows down in here. 
or, or down through there. That's as I say, that's probably a bit red. And as I'm going, I'd maybe add a bit of yellow just to take that out and, and again a bit so of So you wouldn't use like a, a, a burnt umber or anything like that? Not for the flesh tones, no. I usually avoid umbers. The, the closest I would get to, to that in a flesh tone would be one of these um, red oxide type colours, this one being um, Venetian red. Oh, you know, okay. Any of these ones here that we're looking at. So if you start with something like this, adding a bit of white to it to, to get that pinky colour. And then if it's still too raw, because usually you could add maybe a touch of burnt sienna and, and black, and it just takes the edge off the intensity of the colour. But burnt sienna in itself, while it's a wonderful colour, in flesh tones looks a bit bricky. I don't think it's a great colour for flesh tones. At least I personally find it hard to use. And it's hard enough to paint. I like to try and get everything flowing as as um, coherently as I can. So would you mix them all before you start? No. I know artists who do that, and I think it's a great thing to do, but I tend to just go with it as, I, as I'm painting. Yeah. I've sort of got in the back of my mind little formulas, like, you know, when I mention those two colours for a dark skin yeah. tone, but it's never going to be the, the same with everybody, with every person you paint. So I'll always vary it a little bit. Yeah. But it's like, here's a starting point. The starting point generally is something like like this. It's a mid-tone. You know, we were talking before about where does the, where does the life exist in flesh tone. The reason it, it exists in the mid-tones is that's where you can pump in the most colour. Because in the highlights, if you or, or in the shadows, the colour is diminished. In the darks, it's diminished because it's dark. And in the highlights, well, conversely, it's diminished because you're necessarily mixing a lot of... Um, white in that colour in order to get a nice highlight. You know, if you mix white with that, whatever was on the brush, this colour here, yeah. you can see that there's a little bit of that there and you can get some really lovely pastel colours, but there's not the same depth or strength of colour because you're diluting it with so much white. Yes. And in the darks, you're diluting it with other dark colours. So in the mid-tones is where the colour really exists most strongly. This is what I love to do in, in the highlights. Well, not the highlights, but in the lighter tones. They around Maggie's eyes. Oh, yeah. I've used a bit of uh, Viridian. And Viridian in, in a very, just a tincture of Viridian. Yes, mm. look at that. And it's... The reason it's a traditional colour and one that's been used for time immemorial is that it's such a nice colour to use and it mm. has so many applications. So I'm a big fan of Viridian. <laughs> <laughs> this might be of interest, uh, Maria. This is a, a little exercise I was doing one time when I bought some uh, earth colours and I was interested to see how they would mix with white. And you can see that when you look at the colours themselves in their pure form out of the tube, these ones in particular, they add very, very much. This is um, Venetian red, light red, uh, Indian red, Mars violet, Mars orange. So that's those five there. But when you mix a little bit of white, see how these are suddenly very different. That's almost orange. That's unbelievable. That's a bluey, purpley pink. That's almost a, a orangey pink, isn't it? And, and this is different again. So I wanted to see which is going to give me the coolest colour or the warmest colour, depending on what the application is. Yes. Oh, so that's so interesting. Oh, thank you for that. That no is so, so enlightening. Mm -hmm.